The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is your embassy in the heart of Israel, founded in 1980. From our headquarters in Jerusalem through our branches in over 80 nations and yours in Canada, we seek to challenge the church to take up its scriptural responsibility to remind Israel of the promises made to her in the Bible and to be a source of practical assistance to all the people in the land of Israel. On today's program, we take a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee with worship leader Danielle Carmel. Pastor Adam Gabelli discusses the Balfour Declaration with Reverend Malcolm Heading. And we visit the City of David in Jerusalem for some interesting historical lessons. Matthew chapter 14 verses 25 to 31. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you on the water. He said, Come. And when Peter got out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I came over to Galilee uh, to look for my birth mother. I met my birth mother for the first time at the age of 28. I was adopted and I lived in Haifa before that. And uh, when I opened the files of the adoption, I found my birth mother right here in Galilee. By the way, uh, my adopting parents was the best parents on earth. Hallelujah. I was blessed from the first day. And um, also I found four brothers and sisters, a whole new family. A year after I found them, I left Haifa and I came over here to live in Kibbutz Ginosar. That's right where you came to the boat. And uh, by then I was already a boat captain, so I started looking for a job on the lake and the only job I could find was on these kind of boats. And you know, the wooden boats on the Sea of Galilee, 100% of our work is with Christian believers. <laughs> so since the first day I was on the Sea of Galilee boats, I was exposed to the Word of God every day. Hallelujah. <laughs> many people told me about Yeshua, many people prayed for me. Most of all, I could feel the presence, and that's what drew me in. Five years after I started working here on the Sea of Galilee, I just woke up with great love to Yeshua. And you know, at the beginning, it was a top secret. I don't know if you know, but to live as a Jewish believer in uh, Yeshua, in Israel, is not such an easy thing, you know. And this is an understatement. And uh, so for a long time, I didn't share it, but eventually I couldn't hold it in anymore. So I started sharing and I started singing. And you know, I was a drummer all of my life. I knew I could sing, but I didn't want to sing. And then I met Yeshua, I didn't want to drum anymore. I just wanted to sing and to praise Him, hallelujah. <laughs> and uh, a drummer, yes. 
And uh, yeah. <laughs> and so um, I started say, uh, sharing and singing, and you know, the people I was working for then, I was an employee, uh, they were very happy with it at the beginning. You know, wow, we have a believer on the boat. So he's sharing his faith with our clients. Wow, this is great for business. He's worshiping with our clients. Draws a lot of people uh, into the business. Wow. But eventually, many people that uh, only booked a boat until now, now they book a boat in Daniel. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you see? <laughs> so they thought I'm a threat for them. So they just let just let me go. Yeah, that's what I thought at the three three first days. I was devastated. I thought it's the worst thing that can ever happen to me. And I prayed and I asked Yeshua, why is it happening to me? And the 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 answer came three days after that. Three days after I was not on the boats anymore, the first phone call came and, and it was a pastor that used to meet me on the boats. And uh, he said, you know, Daniel, if you are not on the boats anymore, we will take a meeting room in the hotel and you come there and uh, we worship there. So we started jumping from hotel to hotel to hotel. The word came out every night, different hotel. And I'm saying we because it was with Rami. And I'll tell you all about Rami in just a second. And uh, very soon people started asking us to come overseas. So we started traveling all over the world to lead worship. Hallelujah. 2007. We came back from uh, one of our uh, worship tours in America. And um, I went to meet one of my friends here on the Sea of Galilee. And this guy, he lives on the Sea of Galilee. He's got his own marina. And uh, when I came to meet him, I saw this boat. And uh, this boat was not in a good shape since the year 2000. For, 2000, for, for seven years, nobody touched it, nobody treated it. Uh, so it was not in a, such a good shape. But anyway, I asked him if he wants to sell it. So he said, no, he cannot sell it because he just promised it to the city of Tiberias to take it out of the water, to put it on the main road, and to write on it, welcome to Tiberias. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I told him, uh, I, think, I, I think it's a waste. And uh, I told him also, you know, don't just give it out. I'm willing to pay you money. So I said, you know, you give me one week and uh, call me in, in a week. So he went for a week of thinking, and I went for a week of praying. <laughs> and a week after that, I called him, and uh, he said, you know, Daniel, I wanted to give this boat as a gift, so I give it as a gift to you. Oh. Is that a blessing or what? <laughs> Amen. Also, he said, if you want to buy anything, you can buy the motor. So I bought the motor. Still have it, by the way. Very good caterpillar one. <laughs> You know, people, there's a long story after that. Uh, bottom line, I always say, I came over to Galilee to look for my mother, and I found my father. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. So, what comes to mind? Give us some feedback with us being out here. What's, speak out some things that you're thinking or experiencing or uh, rem remembrances of scripture. Talk to us. Who just thought we could be on the Sea of Galilee praising the Lord together? Mm. How awesome. Amen. 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 What happened out here? Walked on the water. Walked on the water. Who? Yeshua. Yeshua walked on the water. Anyone else? Peter. Peter. Uh. Peter caught his own fish. Okay, well, let's talk about the walking on the water for a bit. Okay, so what happened? What happened to Peter? He walked on the water. He was the only disciple that really got out, right? Huh? And, and he walked on the water. But then what happened? He started to sink. Why? He lost his faith. How did he lose his faith? He, he looked at what? His circumstances, right? He's out there. Boy, you got to give him credit for getting out there, right? <laughs> and then he looked at his circumstances and he began to sink. Because he, he thought, this is not possible, right? And the waves and the wind. Okay, so what can we take away from that? 
Because the same thing can happen to us, right? When we're going through life, we have circumstances that hit us. Sickness, finance, kid, children's rebellion, all kinds of things, right? And if we keep our focus on that, what's going to happen? We're, we're not going to be victorious. So the key is we have to keep our focus on the Lord, and He will keep us above those circumstances. So what is it? There's that famous hymn, something about uh, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus, turn your eyes upon Jesus, keep full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Amen. So we're going to have a little bit of a conversation about this whole notion of faith and what happened with Peter when he joined the Lord on the water. Now when I look at that particular verse, it gives me strength to know that if we keep our eyes focused, that we, we could stay afloat because God offers that in our lives. But I also look around the circumstance, me personally, around the circumstance as to what happened with Peter. He started to keep his eyes on his troubles and that's when he sank, we know that. But as Bonnie said, he did get out in the water in the first place. He made that effort and he was rescued. He didn't sink and drown. So even though it appeared that he sank, yes, he might have sank, but he did not drown. And then you look at it afterward, what happened with Peter? He continued to thrive and grow with the Lord. So even when we falter in life, even when we go through these moments of hardship and all kinds of tribulation where we feel there's no answer, there's no hope, because I, I was saying to uh, one, of our, uh, one of our tour guests uh, on this trip that our time is not God's time. In fact, very often we think quietly to ourselves, I wish that God's time was more like my time. I wish that God will hurry things up just a little bit. But we look at what happened on that water and we look at Peter's life afterward with all the mess ups that Peter had in his faith and even when he denied the Lord, the Lord still was yes. faithful in his love of Peter and used him in remarkable ways. So even though we look at how he sank and, and the model is, don't sink in the first place, we still know that we worship a wonderful, faithful Savior and we need to keep our eyes focused on him. That's what I take from that all around in my personal walk. Beautiful. Okay, what else happened out here? Uh, the miracle in catching the fish, where they were out all night toiling and, and brought in nothing, and then he said, what, go back out, and what was it put it on the other side, and they said, yeah, we've been doing this, but, but, nevertheless, they, because they were, it, it went against all reason, right? And they said, but nonetheless, because you've instructed us to do this, we will go out. Obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice, right? Yeah. And so they went out and they brought in that so much their nets couldn't hold it. I love you, Lord. I worship you. I will live before you. Next, Pastor Adam Gabelli and Reverend Malcolm Heading discuss the Balfour Declaration. I have with me today Reverend Malcolm Heading, and it's a joy to have you with us, Brother Malcolm. Um, we've been going through quite a few topics, and I want to talk a little bit about the Balfour Declaration, mm. uh, 19, 19, 1917, and uh, the significance of it. Um, it was more than just a uh, political happening. I, I believe there was great spiritual significance to this, but a lot of um, believers would maybe disagree with me on that. What about the Balfour Declaration? Well, the Balfour Declaration um, 
came out of the crucible of the First World War. And if we have to be honest, um, historians today speak of the Thirty Year War. Hmm. And by that they mean the First and the Second so, World War. Together. Together. Because the Second World War was the continuation of the First. And, um, and the Balfour Declaration essentially came out of the First World War. And the First World War dramatically changed the world. Hmm. In fact, the consequences of the First World War are still being felt today. And the upheavals in the Middle East are all because of the First World War. Hmm. Because the Ottoman Turkish Empire was dismantled. And in its place, um, Lawrence of Arabia promised that if the regional Bedouin and Arabs rebelled against the Ottoman Turkish Empire, that at the conclusion of the First World War, uh, they would receive all sorts of land and uh, positions of power and, and would become kings and presidents and powerful people. Well, hence problems we're seeing today. <laughs> and so uh, even in the Second World War, there was a conspiracy between France and England called the Sykes-Picot yes. Agreement, yeah. where two influential politicians met secretly before the Versailles Agreement and portioned out Split up the, Middle East. the Middle East and were determined at Versailles uh, to ram that through and they did. That's why when you saw the initial pictures of ISIS on your screens about two years ago, they had big banners saying the end of sykes picot They were returning the region in their minds to the caliphate, mm. to the Ottoman Turkish Empire days. And out of the First World War came miraculously the State of Israel. Uh, or at least the undertaking by the British government to pursue such an agenda, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, which is amazing. And again, it tells us that the will and the purpose of God is not going to be shackled to, to the will and the purpose of men. Amen. If Amen. God decides that in his timing, it's now the beginning of a restoration process in Israel, nothing will stop it. Right. And um, the, re the thing that God used uh, in the United Kingdom, or England chiefly, to bring about the Balfour Declaration uh, was, first of all, I think we mentioned it, the Restoration Movement. But that Restoration Movement didn't just arrive. It, it, it was built on the Puritans, the Wesleys, and in the 19th century, we have great preachers in England. So sick, we have the 17th, 18th, 19th century, uh, major revivals in England, Going through the major UK, revivals yeah. uh, that, that swept many into the kingdom of heaven, multiple millions. Touched the world. Uh, touched the world, and we, we, we don't appreciate that today. Mm. Uh, we have no understanding of it, but it was mm. overwhelming. It covered the whole of England, mm. and uh, it was just phenomenal. And great preachers arrived on the scene in the 19th century. And here we're talking about Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Mm. Um, you talk about uh, Bishop uh, J.C. Ryle of Liverpool and amazing people and people who also sort of crossed between the centuries um, who, who were just absolutely incredible. Campbell Morgan and, and, and many, many others and uh, Professor Jacob Janway of the Scottish National Church. Uh, phenomenal. I mean, just these amazing preachers. If you read the works of J.C. Ryle, in the 19th century, the things he said about the coming restoration of Israel wow. is totally phenomenal. He was a prophet, no question. And there was William Hechler, who was uh, his major, Her Majesty's chaplain, general to the diplomatic corps of England in Europe. And he was the individual, of course, who opened up the doors everywhere in Europe for Theodor Herzl to put yeah. forward his ideas about a Judenstadt, yeah, the modern a, Jew, a, a Jewish state. So isn't that incredible? It's all in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Then the beginning of the 20th century, we have the um, First World War, and you have this tremendous embodiment of evangelical Christians in England, mm -hmm. mainly in the Anglican Church, by the way, that mm -hmm. not only influenced the society, but they were in government. Mm -hmm. Lord Balfour was a very, very committed Christian. Mm. And uh, they were in government. I mean, it's an amazing story. 
And then there was a chemist, a Jewish chemist in Manchester. And his name was Chaim Weizmann. All right. And Chaim Weizmann was a chemist, and, and the, the British troops and their allies were being uh, killed on the Western Front by gas. What, the First World War? Yes, by gas attack. The Germans invented the chemical weapons. At that time. Yeah. And Chaim Weizmann invented an antidote to it. Wow. Which saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of troops. Literally saved the British Army and their allies. Wow, that's amazing. And during the, the whole thing when it happened, the government of England came to Chaim Weizmann and said, what can we do for you? What you've done for us is amazing. And he was a Jew. Hmm. And he was a Zionist. And he responded by saying, you can do nothing for me, but you can do something for my people. Hmm. Wow. You need to give them a home. Wow. And Chaim Weizmann being the, the, the tip of the iceberg of the restoration movement was highly sympathetic toward that, took it to the government. And consequently, he was given permission to, he was the Secretary of State, Lord, Lord Balfour, Right. the foreign secretary. He was given permission to issue the Balfour Declaration right. that His, Majesty go His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment of a Jewish state in the land of Palestine. Of Palestine, yeah. And so that is a remarkable thing that took place. It's a miracle from heaven. And if you know mm -hmm. the historical underpinnings, you can see that God worked in the lives of of his people, Christian and Jew, to, to, to bring this about because the book of Psalms tells us that the set time to favor Zion has come. Hmm. The time for Amen. God to pick up his purpose for the Jewish people again and to give them a nation state had come. And so he used the, the First World War, a Jewish chemist, a restoration movement, and a, and a Christian foreign minister who loved the Bible and loved the Jewish people, is the mechanisms by which he could engineer the Balfour Declaration. Now, of course, for political reasons only, you get uh, some preachers, maybe politicians or people like that, who now lament the Balfour Declaration and wish it never been made. And there was a determined attempt by some clerics in England to demand that the British government repent Oh, of what happened, but there was a huge celebration in the Albert Hall mm. uh, last November to commemorate with official blessing from the government the remarkable issuing of the Balfour Declaration, which led to the establishment of one of the most progressive and amazing states on the world stage, the State of the Israel. State of Israel. Well, it is something worthwhile celebrating. Mm. And uh, we thank God for it. So yeah. thank you for bringing some clarity on that, Malcolm. We You're most it. welcome. Wonderful. Our eyes have seen wonderful things, Adam. Yes. We've seen the fulfillment of God's prophetic word. But most of all, we've seen that God is faithful. Mm. The God we serve is faithful. And he's faithful to his Abrahamic covenant, to wow. the descendants of Israel. Wonderful. It's, an, it's a joy to live in this time. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Malcolm. Up next, a visit to the city of David. So we've just crossed the street and now we're on the west side of the old city of David. This is an exciting excavation here going on behind us. In the last, in a, in a little bit more than the last 10 years, they've been working in this place. It was a parking lot actually originally. And now a museum is gonna be built here one day, once they finish all this. But on the way they found, till this moment, 11 different layers of ruins. Since the middle ages, about 1,000 years ago, down to the first temple period, 26, 27, 2800 years back. The main thing you can actually see right now is a massive structure that we can see its side rooms right here behind us. The other end of the same structure is at the other end of the excavation site. It's a very large house with rooms all around, a big garden in the middle, and of course, a few nice little things. I'm sure you all know that when an earring is lost, it's only one earring, the other pair we need to keep it. So one earring was found right here. It's this earring you can see right here. Beautiful. Golden earring with pearls and emeralds. Pearls and emeralds. Where's the other one? Well, I don't know. This is from about 1800 years ago, from the Roman days. I don't know where the other one is. 
but this was found in one of the rooms of this house. Roof tiles were found here with Roman letters on them, mentioning the 10th Roman Legion, the one that destroyed Jerusalem year 70, but rebuilt it as a new Roman city on top of the ruins in the next two centuries. One of the most amazing finds found here December 2008 was found in these rooms right down below us. These are parts of cellars and the beginning of the first floor of a building from about 1400 years ago, the 6th and 7th century. And inside one of these rooms, 264 gold coins were found. All clean, never used, from the mint wrapped in, piece, in a little bit piece of cloth, put on a shelf, and never used. The building was destroyed the next year. The coins are from 613, the building was destroyed 614 in a massive fire, and no one came to get this gold back home. We conclude our program today with some sights and sounds within Israel. Thank you for joining us today and be sure to visit our website at www.icejcanada.tv or call us at 1-866-324-9133. And for our Canadian residents, you can ask for your free Canada Israel pin. Through your contribution, you can participate by giving to ICEJ Canada to the Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors, Women at Risk Red Carpet Project, Operation Life Shield Bombproof Shelters, Shoulder to Shoulder Alias Support, School for the Deaf, Bait Singer Children's Home, Israel in Crisis, Bait Rachel Strauss Inclusive Community, Magan David Adam Emergency Services, Christian Friends of Yed Vashem, Scholarships for Canadian Young Adults to Experience Israel, Educational Fund, ICEJ Communication Media Fund, Gift Estate Securities Funds,